My name is Alex, and today we will talk about test automation theory and practice. First of all, uh, Oliver, thank you very much. Uh, we have some courses across presentation, especially uh, I found that your part on uh, interfaces are uh, very, very useful, and I believe that uh, that's very the right approach. Meanwhile, I'm going to share quite different thought on mocking, and uh, that's quite cool that we are together uh, joining the same meetup and sharing more or less different view or different approaches on the uh, same uh, tool set or whatever. So uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm a software developer, we, and I'm in the industry for about 18 years. I work as developer, team lead, architect, uh, with main domain in distributed computing, security, and automotive. You may think what is common between distributed computing, security, and automotive, but basically there are two things. First of all is high quality process and code. And second thing is networks. So that's two area which I'm usually working on with uh, C++ Go and Python. Yep, first of all, I'm a C++ developer. And then I go developer. But um, anyway, I love meetups, especially Go SG. That's one of them, my favorite meetup. I usually speak here. And also, I'm a big fan of big company, companies. Last uh, During the last 10 years, I was working in Samsung, Kaspersky, Autodesk, and Motional. <clears throat> Talking about Motional, I will have small hiring announcement at the end of this talk. So if you are looking for new challenges, please stay with us. I think I will take 45, uh, maybe 50 minutes as maximum. So please stay with us. And let's talk about testing. Basically, why I'm going to talk about testing. Testing is uh, one of the, I would say, most important part of software development. Because, yep, you can create code, and uh, but you have to support it. Your code have, uh, usually should work for multiple years. It's not just fire and forget. You should support it, you should extend it, you should implement new feature, and almost everything is just impossible without testing. So uh, when we are talking about testing, we have multiple levels. Uh, I believe you already saw this testing pyramid multiple times, uh, which uh, include unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing, you might tell, hi Alex, that's not complete. I, I agree, that's not complete, and I will talk about much more type of testing during this talk, but on high level, this is core part of this pyramid. And uh, on the low level, on low end of pyramid, you can find efficiency. On the high end, you, have, you can find uh, comprehensiveness. And, but also, lower part is much cheaper than high part of the pyramid. And I believe this is incredibly important because, uh, let's say, uh, it. You, you can easily re re restart your unit tests. You can uh, fix them, update something. So it's really cheap. But when you're moving up, price of your test also growing significantly. Let's say we in Motional work on autonomous system, autonomous driving system. And end-to-end -end, end -end testing for us means we have to up upload our software into our car. We uh, should put a safety engineer into this car. We should run the car on the road and do tests. So it's really very expensive. When compared with unit tests, which we can easily run as a part of our pipeline, and uh, when you think about test pyramid, you have to make main accent on cheaper part because expensive part, they are more straightforward in terms of how to test them, 
you can let's say you have a web page a web website you can uh, upload everything on your i don't know what you are using let's say um, amazon cloud just run uh, user based scenarios but you should spend time on uh, installing everything you should simulate user scenarios and so on that's expensive so when you are thinking about test Mm, dependency between um, uh, price is a really important part. So let's start from a unit tests. Unit tests, from my point of view, is a main developer assistant tool. It, a unit test could not uh, guarantee you that your system works well, but a uh, unit test can um, protect you as a developer from uh, uh, regression error. It can help you with uh, system debugging because you're always able to run single test, check what's going on in your, inside your code base and uh, like that. So it's it much easier for you uh, when you have um, your unit tests. Also uh, with uh, unit tests, you Allow you help your colleagues easy to read and understand your code. Why? Because basically when you create unit tests, you have to think a lot about your system design because let's say if you have issue with uh, writing unit tests for your system, most likely it means that you have issue with design of your system. I mean, uh, unit tests, almost always help you improve your system design, but at the same time, it help just a bit or from time to time with your architecture because architecture, uh, because system architecture usually is on much higher level and compare with design and it just don't co it doesn't cover it by unit tests. Um, I will talk about uh, technique which uh, can improve uh, quality of your architecture a bit later, but definitely it's not unit test which will help you with it. So unit tests, that's really simple to create with Go. As I told before, I'm, I spent a lot of time with C++ and on compare with C++ world, Writing unit tests in Go is just it's so nice, it's so easy, and I always wondering why people may not write it in Go, because you're just making your life easier. You have an incredibly good uh, embedded unit test and tool chains, and Go language design with packages, interfaces, and what is more important, circuit dependency ban, allow you to create unit tests much easier. So that's uh, basically, if you remember, Oliver told about uh, interfaces and interfaces and packages, one of the most important parts or which makes your, which makes a unit test creation uh, simple and go. In Go, usually you have package, which includes some small, relatively small chunk of logic in a single domain. Also, your application contains multiple packages and packages interact with each other through interfaces. And why they're doing it? Mainly because of circuit dependency ban. Because if your package somehow will need to refer to itself, Go compiler will just um, I will just tell you that, uh, sorry, I can't compile it. Please fix circle, uh, circuit dependency band first. So this is why we, uh, just because of Go language feature, usually have quite nice and easy to support architecture. And uh, unit tests help you just to improve it. So what uh, should you test with unit tests. First of all, you should try to address object or in worst case package level behavior. You can achieve it usually with mocking. And if you think that mock is a bad idea to use, then do not think about 
unit test and mocks as um, something which help you to check that system works correctly. No, unit purpose of unit test. This is not the purpose of unit test. Purpose of unit test is to um, help you with the stability of your code base. Unit test help you with refactoring. Because if your code behave in one manner before, after refactoring, based on your unit test, you are able to check that your code still behave like before. Yep, maybe from uh, application level of you, your code doing is something odd. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Your, your target is to check that your code works as before, nothing more. So you have external dependency. Mainly, uh, usually you have these external dependencies as an interfaces, just mock it. Don't think about uh, uh, just generate mock. Or if you have some tricky case, you, you can write your mocks by hand. If you have a uh, low level API, definitely you have to mock it. Uh, especially if you work with some system level API, then you. You just uh, do not have any other way because you want to have stable tests. Stable test means you run your test 10 times, and all 10 times, your test uh, gives you the same answer. For, um, they failed or they didn't fail. But you do not want to see anything in between. So what's more, you have to always test your your uh, results, but not but not internal uh, function call sequence. Sometimes, I would say quite often, kind of 50-50, unit tests are absolutely useless because they test call sequence instead of uh, instead of uh, real uh, behavior instead of real output. I will talk about this a bit later. And you definitely have to avoid timers and sleep in your code. Mainly, main reason for this is um, usually we run our tests as a part of pipeline, uh, our uh, CI/CD pipeline. And CI/CD pipeline, again, a, usually we use a virtual machine for running it. On your virtual machine, you have no way. Uh, to guarantee that same delay will happen in multiple um, application restarts. So, yep, if you have no way uh, how, to, if you don't have any option how to remove uh, delays or sleeps or timers, just try to make it configurable. For unit tests, for lots of cases, you may want to increase timeout because. That could be the only way for um, protecting you from false positive alarms. So external dependency smoking. And that's, again, talk about interfaces. We can have a function like this, which accepts some type. And the type can read something. You have usually have to wait how to implement such code. Sometimes could be, for example, file. That's fine. Why not? You can do it. But when you start uh, implementing your unit tests, you actually have an issue here. It's still solvable, but you should create your file first, most likely physical file, put some data into this file, and pass this file into your code. It's possible, but you should uh, perform quite a lot of extra action. And you always have a way how to avoid it. Just use interfaces. And again, we have a reader interface, which allow you to do same read as before, same as file. But you can easily mock your interface and pass your mocked object in instead of file. And you have much more freedom with mock on compare with real objects in terms of uh, behavior testing. So that's why, especially when you're testing your border level, package level API, interfaces are really crucial. You have to use it. 
and test results, but most internal function call sequence, uh, which I mentioned before. I believe you also saw something like this. You have your mocked object and huge chain of expects. I expect that method one will be called, method two, method three, when maybe method one again, method two again. Sometimes you even can find that lock messages also appears in this chain. That's the worst thing which you can do with unit tests. Why? Because basically you do not test anything. You just test that your internal code will do calls, but let's say, what is the purpose of unit, your unit test? You want to help yourself with refactoring later. Will it help with refactoring? Actually not. It will help your life even worse because, uh, because you hard-coded your sequence internally. So just try to avoid this. You should check result, but not internal logic. You care what your, um, what your function, your interface, your company produce for you. You actually do not care how your company did it. And that's uh, very important when you create uh, unit test for you. Coverage and automation tips. When uh, you start thinking about, OK, I definitely need unit test for my project, uh, one of the questions is, which coverage should I try to achieve? Based on my experience, usually 75% is achievable, and it's good enough. 80% is better, and if you just start from scratch, I mean, you have new project, you didn't, uh, you have almost zero code base, it's fine. 80% is amazing. Trying to achieve more, usually you will fail. Or I saw 100% uh, coverage in unit tests, that's possible, but you know, it's incredibly demotivating. Basically, why? If you achieved so high level of uh, test coverage, unit test coverage, what you have is you have a huge amount of unit tests. You cover all tricky cases. And every tiny change in your code base leads to huge changes in your tests. So you changed one line in your code and you change, let's say, 15 lines in your tests. Most likely, you do not want it. And uh, if you are faced with a team which has so huge coverage, usually they were unhappy about it. Because just that's not the case which you really want to support. Um, yeah, uh, unit tests and uh, coverage degradation. That's quite a big problem. If you didn't add any thresholds as a part of your pipeline, coverage will just go down. Why? We're lazy, mainly because of that. Almost all CI CD provides your way to protect you from such degradation. At least, as I know, there are plugin, plugins in Jenkins, Team City, Travis CI, I believe in almost uh, in lots of other as well. Because you always have to add protection from your from um, coverage degradation. I mean, it's fine when you your coverage grows up, and in such case you can even increase your threshold. Let's say initially you had trans a threshold at seventy percent. After, after, I don't know, few sprints, you're, so you see that, okay, now, now I cover 75%. Okay, let's up threshold to, let's say, 72%. Yep, if you have 75% uh, coverage, do not try to set such threshold because tiny changes could um, lead to very small uh, performance up, uh, coverage up and down, like, just a part of person, but let's say if you will uh, goes down from 75 to 74 and 5, you still do not want uh, to have failed build. So just try to go up. And uh, 
very important part, which lots of people forget about, is you have to write your tests before or with your code, but not after. And uh, first of all, yep, it helps you to, to improve your code base a lot in terms of design quality. As I mentioned before, unit tests, if you're unable to write, if you have issue creating unit tests, you have a bad design. So it helps you. And also, it prevents you, or more often your management, from deprioritizing test development task. If you, let's say, split um, coding, implementation coding, and testing into two different user stories, okay, if you work with Agile, then quite likely your product manager will choose implementation and tell, okay, guys, I, we will implement uh, tests later. When later? Oh, some days later. Do not do it. That's very important to have all your tests on the place when you create your code. Because uh, unit tests, it's mainly for you, for simplicity of your work. Fuzzy. Yeah. As I told before, you almost do not have a way to achieve 100% test coverage, unit test coverage, but fuzzing can help you with it. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have a way to ask you to raise your hand if you do fuzzing, but uh, based on my experience, I would expect just a few hands in audience. So let's talk about this incredibly important technique. So, from my point of view, it's really one of the most wonderful testing technique. It doesn't help you to improve your code design quality, unfortunately, but it helps you to cover 100% of your code with such kind of test. By such kind of test, I mean you will catch all your crashes, which is, which is really cool. And uh, you will cover all your tricky parts, which otherwise almost impossible to cover with unit tests. Right now, there are two main tools for, uh, for fuzzing is Google Go Fuzz, which is, from my point of view, have low quality and at the same time, it's less popular, or the view of Go Fuzz, which is more popular and quite, it's, it's uh, really a nice to use tool. So let's talk about second one. How fuzzing looks like? Actually, you need just to add one function into your, in your tests. Like this. Function which have only one argument and it accepts just chunk of bytes. Nothing more. Sounds, sounds really easy. Just create one function and Magic will happen. Fuzzer, Fuzzer is a tool which uh, manage fuzzing process. Fuzzer will generate random input. Fuzzer will monitor execution coverage, and based on execution coverage, it will return back and generate new random input. So it means input is not really random, it's pseudo-random. It depends on your code execution process. Also, Fuzzer will monitor crashes, panics, which happens in your code. If uh, the only thing which Fuzzer can really detect is crashes or panics. It cannot detect that your code behaves not exactly the same as before. And you have unit tests for that. For Fuzzer is for crashes and panics. And if crash or panic happen, yeah, it's unfortunately, but it happens, then it will, uh, Fuzzer will uh, generate crash dump and uh, write crash data. Crash data means data which leads to, unfortunately, event of crash. And let's have a small demo. Please wait a second. I should stop sharing this screen and share my command line. Terminal, yep. Let me check, yep, terminal. 
So I have just one file, fast demo, with next content. This file in contains incredibly stupid error, and actually this, uh, this uh, demo is a typical demo which demonstrates why father is important. So if you pass to your function chunk of data with len of 3, then you check that first symbol is f, second uh, symbol is u, uh, uh, third second, uh, uh, yeah, first, uh, third second is z, that and fourth is again z. This is logical error. It's impossible to achieve because your the size of your uh, array is just three elements, but you do check for fourth elements. If you, if you will think about unit testing, most likely you will just not able to hit this line because when you code unit tests, you think about positive scenario. You think about uh, behavior which you want to prevent from unexpected changes from uh, kind of degradation. So further do opposite. It check it, it trying to check cases which are not covered at all or really challenging to achieve. And as I mentioned before, we have only one function fuzz, nothing more, which will do all fuzz and magic kind of for us. So how to run it? Uh, first of all, uh, you have to do you have to install Fuzzer, something like that. I will not do it because I already uh, have Fuzzer in place. But you, you you should download Fuzzer and add it into your path. So let's uh, let's say you did it. Second step is uh, you have to compile your target like this, very simple. And third step is execute your fuzzer. Yeah, fuzzer is running. And you, what you can see here, so we have one crash detection already, one restart, exact time, so, and some extra inputs. And let's uh, check what we have. Crashes. Ah, yeah, wait a second. So what we have after fuzzing was executed. So initially we had just fuzz them ago. Now we have purpose, list of uh, dictionary which fuzz are used internally. We have crashes report. And we have uh, session suppression, means you can continue your session in the future. That's internal fuzzer information. In our case, we care about crashes folder. So in crashes folder, we have just some output, quoted, and kind of magical file. Let's see internally. Exams in crashes first file. So we have just fuzz. And if you remember from our example, if we will pass a fuzz string for our target, application will bank. Yep. That's what was detected by fuzzer. So oops. <laughs> output. This is our call stack. And uh, so we have call stack and we have data input which leads to your crash. It means you have a really simple way to reproduce your issue. You have input which leads to crash. I, I think it's very good because you should not do. You should do almost nothing. You should just write one function and run fuzzer. 
if your application crashes at the, at the end, you will have exact data which leads to the crash. So let's return back to my slides. Yep. Performance testing. After we add uh, unit tests, we add fuzzing, we may start thinking about performance. When you think about performance testing, good thing is it's really easy to implement. Almost the same as fuzzing. You have your critical workflow and you have a framework from Golang, which allow you to run your, work, uh, your workflow multiple time and calculate average of average time execution and provide you other metrics. Very simple. But uh, in real world, world uh, performance testing is quite challenging, mainly because of your CI CD pipeline. As I mentioned before, our CI CD pipeline usually use usually do not use real hardware. They we use uh, some level of virtualization. We may use Docker. We may use uh, any other type of uh, virtualization, but almost never real hardware. But we have a problem with it. With virtualization, you can never be sure that between two execution of same code, you will have same result. When you have virtualization, it means your physical hardware shared across multiple, multiple instances of your virtual environment. Let's say during one execution of your, perfor your performance tests, it's possible that your physical hardware execute just one instance of your tests. In second time, it could be two instances. And output of your performance testing will be different in this case. So if you use virtualization, you just cannot trust your output. And uh, that's a big problem. So you want to add performance testing into your pipeline, you have to add physical hardware first. Then you should attach your physical hardware to your CI CD pipeline. And here we have even more issues because let's say, uh, if you use GitHub we, as your CI CD, cool, you have actions. And actions allow you to implement um, performance testing because what is the purpose of your performance testing? You want to be sure that you do not have any degradation across um, uh, between your tests execution. And it means you have to uh, use some uh, storage which store tests results and uh, github action help you with it but let's say uh, currently in our company we use jenkins and if you know how to add uh, performance testing from jenkins it would be nice to share because looks like we should implement this persistent storage by our hand yeah correct we should set up some database and uh, do call from Jenkins for storing our data and retrieving it back. It's possible, but still extra action and it costs some money for us. That what not we want to do. Integration testing. That's, uh, I believe, a very important part of uh, tests. Why? So integration testing, the point of integration testing is to test whatever many separately development models work together as expected. I grabbed this from Martin Fowler. And that's true because quite often with unit tests, we have something like that, especially when we use mocking. That was highlighted during first talk. So you cannot, uh, trust your unit test in terms of system behavior. And the point is you shouldn't even care about it. System level behavior 
have to be covered by integration tests. Unit tests and integration tests, they are trying to solve absolutely different tasks in absolutely different manner. What we're trying to solve with unit tests, uh, sorry, with integration tests. Let's imagine we have project with structure like that. We have five components and our database. Components interact with other. Component A and component C have some inputs from outside, from, from the world, and they send data to levels back. Let's uh, think about our architecture and our tests, what we can do here and why unit tests, uh, why integration test will, tests will help you with architecture. As I mentioned before, unit tests will not help you with architecture. That's for design, means it will, unit tests will help to improve your component A internally, but most likely unit tests will not help you with architecture. And architecture means how component A interacts with component B, component D, how the whole system interacts with each other. So you have a world and small components. And unit test and integration test helps you to deal with the whole world. So, what we and how we should test how um, what and how should what should do for um, writing good integration tests. First of all, integration tests simulate whole system, at least on component level, let's say component A. You do not care how component A implemented internally. You care about component A input and output interfaces, nothing more. In some cases, you can uh, think of integration tests like uh, component A and component B together, like, like this. So. You for usually for implementing good in the integration tests, you start thinking on component level dependency mocking. So you do not need to mock your classes. You mock entire system. Let's say if we want to test component D, what we can do here? We can we can create some fake database as an output. We can create a mock for component A and component C, which are input for our component D, and maybe we will care about E, maybe we will not. So we may decide to separate uh, E and D into a single test set or mock uh, E as well. But the idea here is you do not try to test um, internal of your component, you just test behavior. Your company behave as before. And uh, you can achieve it by multiple ways. Let's say you can send, uh, you can record and send your traffic or events uh, on your component, or you can create your uh, code, you can create uh, some code and implement like something like user press, virtually press a button or add some input, just you just simulate workflow. And uh, if your system is really complicated, then traffic or events replaying is better option. If your system is not complicated, let's say you have some desktop service or console utility, maybe no better option would be just a user action simulation. So it absolutely depends on what you are trying to cover, what you are trying to, uh, which workflow you are trying to simulate. So some tips on integration tests. First of all, yep, integration tests are flaky. What that means? Because you test not one class, but system as a whole, it depends on lots of external events which you usually cannot control. Something may just happen in between. 
And in this case, you will have false positive alarm. You can deal with it by multiple, by, by, by several way. Let's say you run your integration tests. Let's imagine you have 100 tests and you split this test into subsets. One subset critical tests. If critical test failed, you uh, mark your uh, build as failed. If some not critical test failed, okay, that's fine. It happens, not big deal. You can add some check like not more than 5% of non-critical tests may failed. It's up to you. Second way we and the, which is I actually prefer more is uh, we execute our integration test set once and check and uh, check which tests were failed initially. We have a list of failed tests and we execute this list of failed tests second time. Almost usually second execution should not fail. So if on second execution you still have failed tests, most likely this is not a flaky test, it's a real issue. If second pass succeed, potentially it's a kind of regression, but usually you can just ignore it. That's fine because integration tests are flaky. What should you use for integration tests? I almost always prefer to use Python. Yeah, I'm talking about Python on Go Meetup. And this is mainly because almost everybody able to read and write Python. I couldn't say so for Go. And uh, in Python, you have library for almost everything, I would say. If you need to do something, just Google a few seconds and you will find library on Python. So you have a simplicity and you have a huge choice of options. And third, op uh, third reason is Python is really good for automation because it uh, allows you to create code fast. It's not compiled, but uh, interpreted language. So you even able to log in into your uh, build pipeline and change something on the flight if you want to kind of debug on the flight. So that's just easy to use. Except some cases when Python is too slow. I faced it with such situation when we had a test, integration test based on Python, but funny fact was Python was too slow and uh, Let's say you have to generate event, uh, let's imagine 1,000 events immediately, but Python interpreter took two seconds just to start up. So it's just, you just cannot use it. It happens, not often, but happens. In such case, you should think about other tool and let's say you can switch to Go, but by default, Python easier to use. And the uh, last part is integration tests are very expensive. If you check some reports from big companies, and I tend to agree with such reports, you may spend about 40% of time on, from, on your development time on integration test implementation and support. So, you can ask your devs to do it. It's possible, but would better to use SDT, who actually, first of all, can create integration tests better than developer. They have a bit different set of mind. And uh, with such separation of work, you can cover more, uh, more cases, which otherwise will be just about which otherwise developer may just forget. So uh, role separation is quite important when you're talking about integration tests. And last, hire an announcement. So we in Motional have multiple open positions. You can just scan this barcode and you will have link on all open positions in Singapore. 
or so and you can even uh, apply to position by yourself or you also can send email to me or you can reach me through LinkedIn. So you are welcome as you wish. It's up to you. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any question about my presentation? What do you think about mutation testing? Sorry, sorry, say again. What do you think about mutation testing? I, I, I never hear such term before. So can oh. you please explain a bit? Because, uh, because is it something similar with fuzzing? Because fuzzing also mutate your data and send some to you. And so fuzzing mutates your data, but uh, mutation test actually mutates your code and see whether your test will break your code. So if the test break your code, that pass the mutation test. Uh, okay, I, uh, I never hear anything like that before. Um, just a few days ago, I saw something more or less similar in C++ world, but there was not code mutation in terms of I have E4 and some function call and I will run them in different sequence, but that was more about let's uh, add some, um, some uh, change instruction sets or let's uh, add some delays uh, in our code and but main purpose of that test was check performance because based on your code order you can have different performance mainly because of uh, caches uh, processor pipelines and so on so if it's something like that and you have critical to performance code, uh, it could be reasonable to use, but uh, I'm not sure that so that it would be reasonable to have such code with uh, implement such code in Go. Maybe C++ would be better options. But for Go, I never faced with such needs, let's say like that. Uh, in a very fast moving project with changing requirements, would you still have a batch of unit tests? Definitely. I believe this is the only way to, man uh, to, uh, to have your project in maintainable state. Because without unit tests, you do not have a way to prevent your project from regressions. And uh, it will, so for your management, it the, your management may feel that tests cost a lot, but the truth is, if you will remove tests for, let's say, one or two months, you will move really fast. But after that, you will just stuck with a lot of different uh, regressions. And what the worst here, you will have regression and have no idea why they're happening and when you introduce them. So anyway, it doesn't matter how fast you are changing your requirements, tests should be in the place, especially uh, unit tests and fuzzing. Because fuzzing, it's kind of about security. Unit testing is a tool for developer which help you with regressions.